So this is the location of the pituitary gland right at the base of the skull and looking at this area in more detail. So you have the posterior pituitary and the infundibular stalk and then it continues uh, with the tuber cinereum. So that is a part of the hypothalamus between the infundibular stalk and the mammillary bodies and that is the optic chiasm. This is the third ventricle which has two recesses in this area, the optic recess and then here is the infundibular recess. And the same anatomy is very well depicted on the T1 size image as well and you can identify here the posterior pituitary bright spot which I have just explained. On the coronal anatomic images again you have the T1 and the T2 you can see the pituitary gland and the infundibular stalk and the optic chiasm and on either side you have the cavernous ICS in the cavernous sinuses and uh, in the cavernous sinus along the lateral wall you have the third and the V1 and V2 that is the ophthalmic and maxillary divisions of the trigeminal. The fourth and sixth nerves are generally not appreciated. Clearly MRI is the modality of choice when you are evaluating this area but importantly it cannot just be a routine MR brain. You have to have a very focused imaging when you are suspecting pathologies in this area. So you have to have smaller FOV, you have to have thinner sections especially on the coronal and the sagittal planes and also when you do the post contrast you have to do the rapid multiphasic dynamic post contrast study especially when you are looking for microadenomas. That is because it is in the early phases that the microadenoma is hypo enhancing relative to the normal pituitary gland and as you go later the enhancement becomes more or less the same. So you have to pick up that differential enhancement in the early post contrast phases to diagnose the microadenomas. So just enumerating the masses, the intracellular lesions are uh, common ones are the physiologic hyperplasia of the gland, microadenomas and then the Rathke's cleft cysts. The uncommon ones would be craniopharyngiomas and metastasis. The rare ones would be meningiomas and dermoids. The rare but important ones would be paramedian ICS and aneurysms. And then the supracellular masses if we have to enumerate the top 5 which constitute more than 75% of the cases would be uh, macroadenomas, meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, uh, hypothalamic opticochiasmatic gliomas and aneurysms. And then metastasis, meningitis and granulomatous disease would constitute another 10%. So what we are going to do is we are not really going to go into the theory of all these uh, uh, diseases because that is very well available everywhere. What we are, I am going to show is some typical cases with some typical findings so that you can diagnose those straight away and then some unusual cases as well. So Elster's rule is an important rule to remember because that gives us the norm, maximum height of the normal pituitary gland during the various stages because pituitary gland is a endocrinolo endocrinologically active gland which varies according to the physiologic needs and so uh, the maximum height can be 6 mm in infants and children up to 8 mm in men and postmenopausal women. 10 mm in all the women of reproductive age group and in late pregnancy and postpartum it may go up to 12 mm. So you have to keep the patient physiologic status in mind when you are looking at the pituitary gland height. Moving on to pituitary adenomas, uh, microadenomas are less than 10 mm, macroadenomas are more than 10 mm and micro are far more common and uh, more than 75% of these are endocrinologically active. Microadenoma is the commonest tumor and these are typically seen as very well demarcated lesions which are hypo on T1 and hyper on T2 but that signal difference is not very great so you have to use narrow window settings to sort of pick up that uh, lesions and uh, anyway if you are looking for a microadenoma you have to do the contrast study uh, to pick it up. Uh, this is an example of microadenoma so as I said look at the T2 and T1 you can barely make out but there is a suspicious lesion just in the left paramedian location there and subtle hypo intensity on the T1 there but once you do the dynamic post contrast imaging you can see this hypo enhancing microadenoma with the normal intensely enhancing pituitary parenchyma around it. So that makes the diagnosis quite simple. This is a woman with Cushingoid features and again you can see on uh, the T2 there is a more obvious lesion in the left lateral portion of the cella with a slightly speckled appearance and even on the contrast it is showing that speckled appearance but it is generally hypo enhancing compared to the normal pituitary parenchyma. So that will again confirm our diagnosis of a microadenoma. Now when we are looking at microadenomas many times you get patients you know with prolactin levels which are just 50 and 60. Generally that is not a setting for microadenomas. Usually if there is a prolactin secreting microadenoma the levels are way high more than 120 to 150 nanogram per ml the normal being less than 20. And many times if we can't pick up a microadenoma especially the ACTS secreting one. Uh, the patient may have to undergo petrosal venous sampling to sort of identify which side of the pituitary is secreting it and then maybe they can do a uh, surgical excision of that half of the pituitary uh, to remove that microadenoma.
Moving on to macroadenomas, these are larger tumors. Uh, the epicenter is in the cella, which is generally enlarged, and they will grow out of the diaphragma, producing a figure of eight appearance. The important thing you have to understand is that hemorrhage and necrosis are a very common feature of this adenoma, although it's a benign tumor. And uh, uh, it's a soft tumor, so even if it encases the ICA, very seldom will you see actual luminal narrowing or uh, obliteration of the ICA uh, lumen. So this is a classical uh, macroadenoma. So you see this large tumor here with cellar, supracellar and then right paracellar component which is involving the right cavernous sinus encasing the right ICA. The fluoid is well maintained and on the T1 sag and T1 post contrast you can see the heterogeneous enhancement. It is extending posteriorly into the interpeduncular system and also anteriorly along the planum synoidal. Uh, the same patient on follow-up uh, with two years after giving bromocryptine and you can see how the tumor has markedly shrunken in response to the bromocryptine and it is now uh, uh, markedly reduced in bulk. Another example of pituitary macroadenoma, you see this typical configuration of the tumor with the supracellar and bilateral paracellar components which are involving the bilateral cavernous sinuses but again the ICF flowoids are encased but still well maintained. Now even in a setting of macroadenoma, we do give a rapid multiphasic contrast imaging that is because many times even with a large macroadenoma, you can sometimes identify residual normal enhancing pituitary parenchyma displaced along one aspect of the macroadenoma and this helps the neurosurgeon to salvage that whatever normal pituitary parenchyma he can. So in this case you can actually see a good rind of normal enhancing pituitary parenchyma which is actually splayed along the superior margin of the central portion of the macroadenoma. Another case of a macroadenoma which is having a three directional extension, so left paracellar, supracellar and then also a extension downwards into the sinoid sinus. So it can go in all the directions and here you can see the optic chiasm, that thin band of tissue that is the optic chiasm splayed along the superior margin of the macroadenoma and again the common feature involvement of the uh, cavernous sinus, encasement of the ICA but maintained flow void. So this patient underwent, uh, this is the post contrast imaging of the same patient. You can see the moderately enhancing tumor going into the sinoid sinus. And on the post operative imaging, you see that the surgeon has been able to excise all the cellar component, supracellar component, the infracellar component. But obviously he has left behind that left cavernous sinus component. So this is that margin of the residual tumor which will now have to be followed up or which can be treated with radiotherapy. So obviously this is the area where the surgeon would not go.